Commission order for Wednesday, December 4th, 2019. Call the roll, please. Commissioner Frank O'Donnell. Present. Commissioner Rocky Smith. Here. Commissioner Denise McGriff. Present. Commissioner Rachel Lyle Smith is absent this evening. Mayor Dan Holliday. Here. Please stand and join me in the flag salute. Pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, we have no citizen, uh, no oh, ceremony for proclamations. Do we have any citizen comment? Last chance, anybody wants to say anything that's not on the agenda, now's your chance. Okay, moving on, adoption of the agenda, everybody okay with the agenda? Yes. yes. Okay, moving on, public hearings, 19-668, first reading ordinance number 19-101019, emergency annexation of 0 .299 acres at 19420 South Pease Road, file number GLUA 19-00012 and AN 19-0001. Ms. Turway. Thank you very much. This application is for an emergency sewer annexation for a property that's a single family home. It's less than a third of an acre and the proposal includes annexation into Oregon City but no zone change or further development. Our senior planner, Christina Robertson Gardner, is here to tell you a little bit more. Thank you. Mayor Holiday, City Commissioners, I have a very brief presentation. This is an emergency sewer annexation. Uh, the subject site is 19420 Pease Road. It's highlighted in uh, yellow to your right, and there's a, I believe, a 2017 Google Street View on your left. Uh, so the property was at, is within 300 feet of sanitary sewer. That's the red line you see uh, where the, air, the red arrow is. It's right in front of the house. So the shaded areas are all inside the city limits? The pink line is the city limits, correct? The okay. dark shaded. Thank you. Uh, it therefore, because it is within 300 feet and ability to connect is there, it must connect. We also have a comprehensive plan policy that says to combine urban pu public facilities and services to the city limits. And so therefore we move forward with this uh, request for annexation. So the process to date, uh, the annexation, uh, the request came in because the applicant requested a sewer hookup and was outside the city limits. Uh, in order to address that, they needed to be brought in. One of the requirements of allowing a sewer hookup was the applicant needed to submit for the annexation and pay for it before the, the sewer was hooked up. And so that was a requirement that the applicant did meet. Uh, the sanitary sewer permit number you see is PU1937, and they've been working on that through this year. The property is 0.299 acres. It's one single family house with an assessed value of 159000 so this is a emergency annexation without a zone change. So what that means is it is hooked up to city sewer. It was already hooked up to city water, but it was paying it out of uh, city rate, so it'll go to the city right now. Uh, it'll stay the county zone, which is FU10, future urban 10 acres. Uh, and with that uh, county zone, they will be uh, required to acknowledge that they cannot uh, divide or add on to the house or really do any development until such time they come in for a zone change. And they are in the low density residential comprehensive plan district, district, so they would come in for a residential zone change at the time they wish to move forward on anything other than exist as their single family house. Any questions? Yes, please. Go ahead. A couple of questions. So I noticed in the application that this is, uh, was, is the, um, the resident is the person that requested this annexation because it looks like it's owned by some sort of a development company. So the uh, the there was a person who purchased it for a rehab, and he bought the house as is and realized that the sewer could not be repaired. He uh, rehabbed you mean the house. The septic. The septic. Sorry, okay. the septic cannot be repaired. He realized when you buy a house as is, sometimes that happens, and uh, yes, he did end up, and I believe it just just been sold. So. Why did this get hooked up before it was annexed? We allow emergency annexation as contingent to uh, paying for uh, an annexation application. Technically, it's required by uh, DEQ. We have to allow them to hook up. Yeah, so we could not sign off on this, the septic repair. Okay, well, my only experience with this, of course, is the park place in which was the, the big kahuna, and we did not hook up anybody before because sewer wasn't really available. We didn't hook anybody up before we annexed. 
In this situation, sewer was, was available, available right yeah. in front of their house. Okay. Is that it? Yes, please. Thank Is there you. a motion? What's that? Yeah, we gotta get oh. out of oh, hold on. Public. Sorry, this is a public hearing. So <laughs> I'll open the public hearing. Do we have any, uh, any any comment on this from anybody? Is the applicant here? Anybody want to see anything? Seeing none, I'll close the public hearing. Now, is there a motion? Move to approve first reading of ordinance number 19-1019, emergency annexation of 0 0.299 acres at South Peace Road. Second. Move and second, Mr. Biden. Ordinance number 19-1019, an, or an ordinance of the City of Oregon City approving annexation proposal number GLUA 19-00012, AN 19-0001, and approving the annexation of certain property located at 19420 South Peace Road to the City of Oregon City. Call roll. Commissioner Denise McGriff. Aye. Commissioner Frank O'Donnell. Aye. Commissioner Rocky Smith. Aye. Mayor Dan Holliday. Aye. Moving on. First reading of ordinance number 19-1008, planning file LEG 18-0001, development code amendments for clarification, correction of errors or improvements, Ms. Turway. Thanks very much. Um, this is the follow-up from our big code amendments. We waited six months or so and decided that we would do a cleanup on the original ones. Um, everything in this packet you've taken a look at before and given us direction except for one thing. Uh, we did receive a public comment um, from Mr. Nasita expressing concern about duplex uses within the MUC zoning designation. Just a reminder, MUC zoning designation is a lot of places in the city, particularly up 7th and Malala. Um, so before you, I wanted to enter into the record a couple of new things. Um, there is an email exchange with Mr. Nasita and myself, and there's a couple attachments to that email exchange as well. There's two versions of our MUC code. One is some code amendments to MUC, and one is um, a clean copy of those code amendments as well. So what the um, argument Mr. Mesita made is that duplexes should be allowed in MUC. We have a lot of places in the McLaughlin Conservation District that are currently single family homes but are zoned for mixed use quarter, which is a high, higher urban uh, density zoning designation. Currently within the mixed use corridor zoning designation, um, and then I'll also talk to Pete as well, I just wanna do a quick intro. Um, currently within the MUC zoning designation, we allow three and four plexes, we allow one or two units with a business, and we also allow live work units, but we don't allow duplexes outright. In these uh, proposed code amendments, if you wanted to accept them today or not, it makes two changes. One is to allow internal conversions for designated structures in the McLaughlin Conservation District. And the other one is it allows duplexes within structures a minimum of 20 years old within the McLaughlin Conservation District as well. Pete Walter, senior planner, is here to tell you more about everything as well. And um, my apologies for the late lock-on of the code amendments. I just wanted to address the concern that um, came recently were, before the commission. Were these provided in our packet? They were not provided in your packet. I'm, you know what? I'm not, gonna, I'm not interested in seeing this tonight. Let's bring it back. I, yep, I want to have time to look at this. I want to have time to, to read all the stuff. Are, um, are you sure it wasn't in the packet? Because I... Well, some there, so what you had in your, you had a complete package of right. code amendments, and then you right. had a comment from Mr. Nasita right. saying we should add duplexes. Well, I just, so I, didn't I did see the, the red code line. amendments. If you yeah, wanted saw, to add duplexes, here's the here's the amendment. So we have an existing package ready to go. If you wanted to add internal conversions and duplexes, these are these are the code amendments you would want to swap out. You can choose to swap them out or not, or you can choose to continue. It's, it's all up to you. I, I, I saw what the red lines were, and I feel comfortable in having a discussion about it tonight. I don't want to delay this any further, we, but I do have a couple of questions. Well, this, this, this again comes back to my point that Mr. C that continues to drop stuff on us at the last minute without us having the opportunity to hear, you know, understand what it is that he says or, you know, 75 pages of stuff that we have to read and figure out before we have a meeting. I did the co red lines to implement the comment, should you want to do that comment. No, I get that. So Dan, we have the option, we do not have to consider 
the request. Commissioner Griff. I mean, we don't have to consider it, do we, if we, if we don't deem it? Certainly not. So, I mean, we have options. We have options. Ask me questions. Okay. Laura, um, just, you said that all really fast. So the last two things, so I see here, um, my understanding is that the request is for a building in the MUC. I, is his building designated? Because I did not, not think that it was, because it had had so many exterior alterations that it possibly, with a lot of money, could be recoverable, but my understanding it was not a designated structure. So you're proposing this internal conversion so, would apply only to designated structures, or? Yeah. I so mean, that's what his requ his request is, not I, you. Sorry, didn't mean yeah, to. Yeah, so the, I think the larger policy question he's presenting is within the conservation district, if you want to preserve some of these structures, is the suite of suits in MUC1 amenable to that? And um, we do have some options, but should there be more options for things that you could do with your home? We're focusing on these code amendments on um, internal conversions for designated structures. Um, and the idea there from the planning division's perspective is we want to encourage designation of structures. So one may voluntarily get their sure. structure enough to designate, but then also you can kind of keep that exterior mass and then do an internal conversion of up to four units depending on your lot size. Um, so that might be a way to keep that exterior skin but get some more dwelling units on the inside. And okay. then the second. So stop. So then. <coughs> I am well aware generally of which structures along that MUC corridor are designated and with the exception of a few, couple of them, they're occupied residentially, but the others are being used commercially, which is allowed in the MUC zone. So there is a broad suite of things that people can do right. with structures, whether they're designated or not, within the existing mm. code that we have for MUC. That's true. So I guess what you're really... As, as the question is, is that do we want to add duplexes to the MUC zone as applied to designated structures? So what if somebody has a non-designated structure with that, how would that apply? So we, there's two provisions. One is internal conversions for designated, and then the other one is duplexes, but it is not limited to designated structures. It is for structures 20 years old or, or, or more, which is the same provision we use for internal conversions. And the idea there is we do have a lot of structures that are undesignated, and the setup of some of those structures may really not be conducive to uh, a triplex or some other suite of option that we allow. And so this would help facilitate more dwelling units in those cases. We have a lot of the area, like where we are towards the promenade, towards away from 7th, that is zoned MUC, that is single family. Mm -hmm. So it may not look like it's zoned MUC yet, but it is zoned MUC, so we do have a lot of that in between. My fear in just saying that duplexes would be allowed is that these lovely buildings would be demolished and we would get a new duplex. So that's where the 20 year timeline comes into play. There is a drawback to all of this discussion and that is the public input part of it. Um, Pete can tell you more about it, but I know he talked to uh, the chair of McLaughlin Neighborhood Association today, but obviously this is all last minute, so. Yeah, I, the only thing that I would add is that I called Cameron McCready this afternoon yeah. and let him know about the situation and uh, I understand that there's a steering committee meeting tomorrow um, and he was generally supportive of the idea but was very concerned that it was last minute and that the medical office and neighborhood association had not had time to really discuss it so here's where I'm at you know I'm, I'm we went through a very 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 lengthy process to get us here and uh, there were multiple opportunities over multiple years for Mr. Nusita to give his comment or to have a question or to submit something for the record. And he did not do that. So at this point in time, if we're going to if we're going to have this discussion, it needs to start at the planning commission and then come up to us. This is not something I'm interested in do, doing in the commission fiat at the last second without any kind of public input or any kind of process. I'd agree with that because I come in here prepared to vote on the packet as furnished and I'm not prepared to digest this new material and I, I'm, I concur with the mayor's statement in this case. 
I, I would like to just move forward. I'm not really interested in considering this because I think that there are too many implications and I agree with your comment that there were, well, I know how long we discussed it at Planning Commission and I know how long we discussed it here. And I think under the circumstances, there has been more than an ample opportunity Absolutely. to jump into this and make that suggestion. I appreciate the comment. I understand what the concern is, but I also really want to get this off the docket and move it forward. And I'd like to see us vote on this tonight. Are there any other questions on the main body of, let's assume we're not considering the, the right. amendment or whatever it is, are there any other questions about the rest of these changes? No. It's well, the addition doesn't satisfy Jim's Nasiva's concern, right? The what? The, I mean, we're not we're not doing this addition. We're not doing making this not. change. No. Right. I, I don't. Is it the discretion of the commission? I, I don't. Right now, I'm hearing. So the red line version does not contain this amendment, does it? The everything in the packet is good to go as it stands. If you would like to consider the amendments that came out of we don't. these comments, they're so, the ones that are on paper before you. Okay, so is there a motion? Um, there is public hearing. Public oh, hearing. That's right. Okay. Public hearing. We have Commissioner uh, Esther Barstad. Yes. Come on up. Hi there. <laughs> Uh, I am speaking regarding Agenda 6B. Sorry, I have a little bit of a cold. My name is Esther Barstad, and I am a local Oregon City resident. I manage the Mount Pleasant Mobile Home Park and have for over 15 years. Our man manufactured home park offers quality living at an affordable price. I am speaking today regarding the Municipal Code Chapter 17 point 20 as it relates to manufactured home parks. The current development requirements do not meet the pro proposed, the purpose of providing local affordable housing options. I'm in favor of the proposed code revisions and request that they be adopted timely without further delay. In August of 2019, the code relating to manufactured home park setbacks was changed. While the city adopted a variety of flexible standards, a few setback changes are now overly restrictive. The minimum setbacks between homes went from six feet to 15 feet. This is more restrictive than the Oregon Manufactured Specialty Building Code, which is the standard that manufactured home parks use when building. For example, the majority of homes in our community are double wide homes that are 27 feet wide, placed on 45 to 55 feet spaces. Most of our existing homes are currently 9 to 14 feet away from an adjacent house. Currently, if a resident unexpectedly suffered a loss, such as a fire, they could not place their existing home back because the current setbacks make it nearly impossible. Having such large setbacks in high density parks is too restrictive and will detrimentally affect our manufactured home communities. In 2017, we learned that our community was zoned for 70 spaces, but we currently have 68. The process of adding two affordable homes was put into action. In 2018, after receiving preliminary approval from the city, we ordered two new homes. Here we are in 2019, the codes have been changed and two spaces remain undeveloped and affected by the new setbacks. Additionally, two more vacant spaces are still detrimentally affected by the current codes. The Planning Commission endorsed the code amendments that you are reviewing tonight. They support the changes. The reading of this amendment has already been postponed once, and if it is postponed again, it will still take us more time before we can move forward on our projects. We have four lots that can provide affordable housing options for residents in Oregon City. In the time where skyrocketing home prices make the dream of owning homes difficult, our manufactured home parks can still offer quality affordable housing options. Please do not make our ability to do this unachievable. I'm in favor of the proposed revisions and I'm asking that you adopt them timely without further delay. So let me ask you a question. So 
the, the amendments that we're talking about tonight will fix your problem? Yes. Okay, that's all I need. Yeah, I didn't understand that. Yeah, sorry. That's all right. I, thank you. Thank you. Uh, is there any, oh, Mr. Mahoney. Huh. I should say Commissioner Mahoney, it doesn't matter, pick one. But I get to speak twice. No. <laughs> that one, that one's all germed up, yeah, so stay over there. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Frank. Now my hat comes on. Yes, sir. <laughs> Bob Mahoney, I represent the assessed valuation at 2, 240 Park Drive. <laughs> what does Mrs. Mahoney have to say about that? My advice to you is don't do it. Don't do what? Don't do what you're thinking about. Pass this amendment. Uh, I'm a planning commissioner. Which Pass. amendment are you talking about? Well, the one that you're talking about, whether or not you're going to do it on the duplexes and... And oh, no, we, that, we're past that already, Bob. We're not doing it. Okay, that's all I want to know. <laughs> all right. <laughs> and the reason I say that is because you're getting ready for an update on your comprehensive plan, as I understand it, because you're talking about funding it through the, through the budget process. There's where all this complication, and it seems to me like things are getting so complicated. My goodness gracious. Um, the state's taken away your ability to consider annexation as the implications of what that means. They're also telling you that we're gonna change our residential zones to single family or you know, just a residential. And you, you seem to be losing our sense of direction here is where this big picture's headed. And we all know that housing is getting more and more expensive. And there's gonna be a phenomenon that take place here with the new uh, Generation X they're uh, all of a sudden starting to flex their muscles on the, uh, on the uh, environment and uh, gun laws and things like that. These are young people that all of a sudden, their power, their political power is, is, is starting to take, take uh, effect. And what that means is there's gonna be a migration of these young people to the smaller communities because that's where they feel safe. That's where they feel they can buy homes and raise their kids and school districts that work. So what I'm saying is all these things that were taken on piecemeal should really be considered in your comprehensive plan update. That's what I'm saying. Okay, thanks, Thank sir. You. Appreciate Thank it. You. Anybody else? Seeing none, I'll close the public hearing. Uh, I want to just, so staff is recommending that we approve this. No, we no. approve as okay. furnished in the packet, correct? Without, without the so not, so not this without, update. Right, that's correct. Okay, so we support when, the code, of, I mean, those revisions. Which so you revisions? do. Which, revisions? which is kind of you what's implied by to, this email but you can that's sent to Jim Nacita saying that that's kind of what we were going to be looking at tonight. I, I, I said I, that I, I would. How, hold them. on a second. I understand that you support the amendment. I don't support the process that how it got here. So if we're gonna amend that, that one section, I believe it needs to go back to the Planning Commission. I would agree. Does anybody disagree with that? No. Nope. I, I do not. Okay. All right, really then, then that's over. So is there any other questions or does somebody wanna make a motion? I would like to make a motion, please. I'd like to recommend that we approve uh, the first reading of ordinance number 191008, planning file LEG 18-0001, development code, amendments for clarification, correction of errors, and improvements. Seconded. Mr. Goodbye. Ordinance number 19-1008, an ordinance of the City of Oregon City adopting amendments to Oregon City Municipal Code, Title 16, land divisions, and Title 17 zoning. Call roll. Commissioner Denise McGriff. Aye. Commissioner Frank O'Donnell. Aye. Commissioner Rocky Smith. Aye. Mayor Dan Holliday. Aye. Last public hearing, 19-609, uh, first reading of ordinance 19-1017, amending development agreement to extend pasture reimbursements for constructed stormwater facility. Mr. Parna, this sounds exciting. Thank you, Mayor Holiday and City Commissioners. So this is a really straightforward amendment, and um, Ryan Bradyhoff, our management analyst, has worked with the developer on this, and he's just going to give a brief presentation to make sure everybody understands what's happening, but it's really just a simple extension. So with that, I'll turn it over to Ryan. Thank you, Wyatt. Good evening, Mayor and Commissioners. The purpose of this ordinance is to extend a development agreement for one year. 
Uh, this has no financial impact on the city, being that this is just a um, pass-through payments between developers. So, but I do want to pro provide a little bit of background about the development agreement for your information. So, if you can draw your attention to these two attached maps. The first one here, obviously a map of the city, notice the green arrow pointing to a kind of a blue shaded area there. If we go to the second map, we'll see that area zoomed in, kind of enlarged. Apparently not. <laughs> <laughs> And that area is the subject of this development agreement. So this agreement was entered into in 2008 between the city and John Jones Construction. Um, the agreement included a number of things. Um, one was the four lot subdivision there for Jones. So the city approved that along with um, a, a zone change and a lot line adjustment, et cetera. Also included in that agreement was the stormwater facility that Jones constructed. So there it is in red in the southwest corner. Now that stormwater facility serves, or was constructed to, to serve 442 lots um, represented in that blue area. And then one other piece of this agreement was that the city agreed to reimburse Jones for constructing that stormwater facility over time. So as um, lots develop in the area, and as permits are issued, city collects a fee on the building permit and then simply remits it to Jones as a pass-through item. Uh, one other thing to note is keep in mind, obviously, that that stormwater facility is a much larger capacity than just Jones's four lots, obviously. So now here we are in the agreement, this development agreement that was entered into, into and back in 2008 is now going to expire this month. And the issue is that there are still parcels there to be developed, and if the agreement was in effect, Jones would continue to receive reimbursement for constructing that pond. And so Jones reached out to the city a couple months ago and expressed an interest in extending this agreement. The issue with that is a development agreement per, per Oregon revised statute has a limit, a limited duration of 15 years, and so that's not going to get us very much further for Jones. So I think the best solution is if the city to enter into a brand new agreement with Jones to extend the period of reimbursement for a much longer period, and then also see what the city can get out of, out of that agreement. For instance, there are some transportation system improvements that, are, that the city is interested in in this area, and we believe Jones can assist the city with that. So we feel like it's beneficial to enter into a new agreement in the future. However, this ordinance is just to extend the existing agreement for one year, just to give us time to sit down with Jones in the coming months and hopefully enter into a longer term agreement. Okay. Questions? No question. Um, yes, I have one for um, Josh. So as I understand this, he was required to do more than what would be required for the four lots that he was putting in. So what is the percentage that he put in versus the percentage that he's going to get back? I mean, so it's, is it like an 80-20 or his portion of it? Because I'm assuming the redevelop, the reimbursement is coming from other development on that development, if that makes any sense. The intention was that he would get all of his money back assuming that those estimated lots, they estimated 442 lots in this area, assuming those all develop and are issued a permit, he would be fully reimbursed. But what about the part that his four lots play in the bigger picture? I mean, isn't there some cost that he is going to be required to bear for the pond? Because obviously he's going to be putting, those lots are going to put stuff into it. Right, so those four lots. So yes. he, he's not getting 100%. Minus okay, his so, share. So 338 lots. Okay. That wasn't real clear. Okay. I just Sorry. was, when you said he gets 100%, I thought, okay, so he develops four lots and then gets it all back? No, wait a minute. Okay. Okay. Uh, any other questions from the commission? I'm going to open the public hearing. Is there any comment? Seeing none, I'll close the public hearing. Is there a motion? I guess I'll move to approve the, let's see, which number are we on here? First reading, six, six, six yeah. First reading of uh, ordinance number 19017, amending development agreement to extend pass-through reimbursements for construction of stormwater facilities. 
One zero. One, yeah. One seven. Is there a second? Second. Mr. Biden. Ordinance number 19-1017, Ordinance of the City of Oregon City, amending Ordinance 08-1003, a development agreement with John Jones Construction, Inc., pursuant to ORS 94.504 to 94.528, is amended by Ordinance 09-1003. Call roll. Commissioner Denise McGriff. Aye. Commissioner Frank O'Donnell. Aye. Commissioner Rocky Smith. Aye. Mayor Dan Holliday. Aye. Okay, on to general business, 19-691, discussion and deliberation for appointment of the Urban Renewal Commission positions. So we have two here. We have uh, a request for a reappointment from Mr. Van Haverbeek, and then we have two positions for uh, two applicants to uh, replace uh, Commissioner Mitchell, who has resigned. Uh, you want to take one first, Mr. Uh, Commissioner Smith? Um, before we get into the applicants and the interviews, um, I just want to ask a question of the commission of process, I guess, or, or um, policy. Um, when we have city commissions, whether it's planning commission, urban renewal commission, um, or other committees within the city, we um, do that for citizen involvement, um, input, and we have open seats for those places. Um, I just am questioning whether or not in the past and in the future, um, whether or not it's appropriate to have one citizen sit on two different bodies. Um, for instance, Urban Renewal Commission and Planning Commission, or any other scenario. Um, is there any it, precedent for that? I don't think there is, but I think it's a question that I can, you know, the more involvement that we have by the citizens, the better. And so having one citizen represent the community on two different bodies, I'm not sure is the best way to do that. Well, I, so it's a question that, and I know that clearly sometimes we don't have enough applicants. <laughs> I was going to say, I might agree with you, you know, had we I had 10 that. applicants, but. <laughs> but yeah, we, we also always don't fill them. You right. Know, if we feel like there's candidates that are not um, at the level that we expect them to be, then we don't necessarily fill them either. Exactly. But um, we don't have to. So I think it's just something I've thought about in the past where I don't know if that's the best way for us to fill slots, but. We have had members in the past be on multiple uh, boards right. or committees. Typically we try to, um, if something's gonna be conflicting, um, for example, if you were gonna be on the city commission and on the planning commission, because items go to the planning commission and then can go to the city commission for a final uh, approval is probably not appropriate, but we'd have to talk about this. A better attorney. example would be HRB and the Oh yeah, commission. those right. as yeah. well. Either one. Any quasi-judicial. Right. Um, so as far as urban renewal and uh, planning commission, no, I'm not sure. We'd have to uh, look into that. I don't see you that would. there's a conflict. Oh, uh, Mike Mitchell currently serves yeah. both. Or did. Well, cur he, well currently until oh, he, December he, he 31st. Just, yeah, he just <laughs> resigned from the... From the uh, Urban Renewal Commission because they so we do have half a, their time in Ben. We do have a precedence of doing that. Yeah. Okay. Anybody else have anything to say about that? No, I, I think we just need to take it on a case by case sure. basis. I agree. And I think that's really the way to go. I I don't see that there's a, a a problem currently, and if there is, we will probably call it out and make a decision accordingly. Okay, so let's take Mr. Van Haverbeek first. Is there any reason that we would not want to re reappoint Mr. Van Haverbeek? Are there term limits on? Uh, there are commission? not term limits, but uh, currently the vacancy is for one four year position and then which is um, currently being held by Steve Van Haverbeek. And then the remainder of Mike Mitchell's term would be a two year uh, term. So, so I'll have a chance to look this. at it again in two years. No, I understand with, where with Commissioner, with, Commissioner yeah, I, I understand where Commissioner Smith is coming from, and I, I always wish we had a larger candidate pool than we get, and I'm, I am never averse to reopening it. And the question is, do we always always get this limited number of candidates, or is that a recent development? And if it, we used to get more, why did we get more then, and we don't get that now? 
So I like to have a wealth of candidates to choose from. And I understand everything else that was said. It's just my personal preference. I think the last time we did a renewal, we had a pretty. I think it was. Large we did. Pool. We had a large. Ten or twelve. We had a large pool. Um, the number of candidates doesn't always mean the quality of no. candidates. <laughs> so I just. Okay. So I just. I, I'm not trying to say anything against. Not even the last time. I mean, just in general. No, no, right. right. Um, just because we get a number of candidates doesn't mean that they're always the best quality. I'm just. Stating that. Okay, so to answer my first question is, is there any reason why we wouldn't want to reappoint Mr. Van Haverbeek? And you're talking to the four-year term? Yes. I mean, he's up to speed on everything that we're doing in the renewal. So there's no learning curve for him. Conspicuously silent. You can make a motion or. Um, um, I think he he definitely is to speed with where we're at. It's been part of the, the process. I, I don't know how much Steve contributes to converse discussions about these topics always. Um, so just having a, a um, someone that knows this stuff and is just a placeholder doesn't necessarily make a good candidate. Um, pull them out. It's true. Put them underwater. Rarely gives input to the to the Urban Renewal Commission on topics that we make and decisions we make. In fact, I think talked more tonight in his interview than I've heard him talk in any Urban Renewal Commission since he's been on there. Okay, so I'm getting a sense that maybe we want to go back out and see if we can get more candidates. Is that what we're hearing? I'd like to take another swing at it and tell you the truth. I, I don't. I think we have um, some people that have applied that uh, I think uh, clearly would be appropriate to appoint to this. And uh, I'd like to see us move forward. And make a motion. Keep in mind that we have to decide if you make a motion for two candidates for two positions, which one would go to what? Because one's two year, one's four. Well, let's, do do the, let's do the four year term first, and then we'll do the two year term. So who do you want to put in the four year term position? I would just like to say I'd like to see uh, Sean Cross take the four-year. I think he's got a, um, a, a good understanding of what urban renewal is, and it doesn't help to have another financial mastermind in our midst besides Mr. Parno. It doesn't help or it doesn't hurt. I think it helps. Yeah. <laughs> um. I'll second that. Moved and seconded. Anything else to say? Call roll. Okay, so I understand Sean Cross for the four-year position has been yes. moved by Commissioner McGriff, seconded by Commissioner Smith, and Commissioner McGriff, I'm calling you first for the Aye. roll call. Commissioner O'Donnell? Aye. Commissioner Rocky Smith? Aye. Mayor Dan Holliday? No. That motion carries. So for the two-year position. I'd like to move that we uh, appoint uh, Steve Van Haverby. Okay. Just a second. Gotcha. I'll second it. Move and second it. Call roll. Commissioner Denise McGriff. Aye. Commissioner Frank O'Donnell. Aye. Commissioner Rocky Smith? No. Mayor Dan Holliday? No. So now we have a problem. Um, and I would propose that we uh, we move this, uh, this next position to the next meeting in December when we will have a five-member commission and we can make a decision at that point. 
Objections? No. Okay, there we go. Moving on. 19-676, uh, first reading of ordinance number 19-1020, amending Title 12, Section Ooh, Title 12, Section 12.16.040, Camping Prohibited Section of the Oregon State Municipal Code, Captain Davis. <laughs> or do you want to say something well, first? Let me just say one thing really quick, just for, uh, whenever you say really quick, it takes a long time. Sure. <laughs> you just made it. <laughs> um, I, just one little point of clarification. That we have some folks that, um, uh, I think the mayor's communicated with some folks. I've communicated with some folks who I think are here to speak. Um, uh, some, at least I think from Gladstone, which is great. The, the one thing that I just wanted to say about this, we are not bringing this before you because of some concerns that have come up from some folks in Gladstone. This was already in the works. This has been in the works. Um, so we had relayed to them that we were bringing this in front of you to help us deal with some of the issues that we're saying and said, hey, you want to come show up? Might be a good time. Listen, say something. But one uh, is not necessarily tied to the other. Does that make sense? Yes. Sure. Captain Davis. Captain Davis and uh, Officer Day. Good evening, Mr. Mayor and Commission. Uh, I'm Sean Davis. I'm Captain with Oregon City. And this is Mike uh, Day. He's the homeless liaison officer, soon to be detective. Uh, we're, here Congratulations. <laughs> we're here to make a recommendation to revise our current language to our prohibited camping ordinance 12.16.040. As you are aware, homelessness and unauthorized camping is something that is affecting our community and other communities along the West Coast. Uh, several communities lately have been in the news, like Salem and Longview, Washington. They're dealing with similar issues. Uh, we have an ordinance that is fairly good. However, we've as we're moving forward with some issues, we want to propose some language uh, that would help us in enforcing this. Because of our homeless crisis and our increase of homeless, we've created our homeless liaison officer position, and Officer Day has done an incredible job at getting resources and people housed. However, there's some people that uh, are resistant to change and that do not want any assistance. Um, Officer Day is briefly going to talk about what uh, what he has done, what's working, and what we can do better. He's also going to briefly talk about Martin versus Boise, which is a ruling that came out in the Ninth Circuit on September 4th, 2018, that greatly affects everyone in the Ninth Circuit. Mayor, Commissioners, Mike Day. I, uh, about two and a half years ago, a little over two and a half years ago, I was assigned as a homeless liaison officer in response to this, uh, you know, sort of growing homeless problem in Oregon City. And that was a step by the city and the police department to take a really sort of outside the box innovative approach to addressing homelessness. And it's allowed us as a police department and myself as a homeless liaison officer to do a lot of wonderful things and outreach for that homeless community. Um, helping many people into housing, helping many people keep their housing who are at the brink of losing housing, helping people find employment and get vital documents and things of that nature, obtaining some $76,000 in grant funding to be able to do those things. Um, and also address, addressing a lot of livability concerns in the city of Oregon City. Uh, with all of that said, and I knew getting into this position, and I, I, I know that homelessness is a much larger issue than uh, a police department, a city itself, <coughs> and certainly one officer trying to, to put an impact in that problem. Uh, and so we always needed to be looking at what can we be doing differently? What can we be doing better? We've seen these successes. What, what other successes are other people having? Um, and so that's when we really started to revisit this uh, this code and some policy stuff, which Captain Davis is going to talk about. And we had to take into consideration for what we can be doing differently a ruling that came uh, back in September of 2018, which was the Martin v. Boise ruling. And essentially, in a nutshell, what this ruling said is that unless we are providing an alternative, we cannot take criminal uh, an alternative shelter option. We cannot take criminal enforcement action against persons who are camping because they have a right to sleep. So it's cruel and unusual punishment if we take that criminal enforcement action. Um, so we've been working really hard uh, to sort of determine what that alternative looks like. And we've got a lot of stuff in the works. As, as Chief Van said, we're working on that, not just as a result of some recent stuff that's been coming in, but as a result of just sort of continuing to grow and be innovative and address the issue in a manner that best provides trying to get every homeless person in this city off the streets and also trying to make it the most livable city it can be. 
Uh, when the Boise ruling came out, uh, we immediately sought legal advice from, and we spoke with our city attorney, Bill Kabeisman, uh, the city prosecutor, and also our municipal court judge, Lauren McNeese. Uh, this ruling has been challenging for all our communities. It's been challenging for us. There's uh, what we can't do and what we can't do is very challenging. So we looked at what other communities are doing, and specifically we, we looked at Gresham. Uh, we, we talked to uh, community outreach, uh, Kevin Dahlgren there, and we saw what was going on and we've been kind of working with him because uh, they have taken an approach where they, and he also put us on that ORS 203, or Oregon Revised Statute 203.077 requires local governments to develop a humane policy for removal of homeless camps from public property. We currently don't have that, so attached to this is the proposal that we're working with to get that, so basically, Anytime we go into contact with a homeless individual who's in a camp, in a public place, we're gonna reach, do outreach. We're gonna ask them, are they going to, do they want assistance? If they say no, we're gonna say, okay, camping is illegal. We'll be back in 24 hours and we're gonna clean this up. So this, this whole thing is a larger approach than just this ordinance. Uh, it is, we need to find a way to clean up these camps in a timely manner, because right now we currently use Metro um, to do our cleanups. Metro is a great resource. However, they're doing Portland, Multnomah, uh, Portland, Multnomah County, Clackamas County, and they only can come around about every two weeks to maybe once a month. So it's very difficult for us to be on top of this and clean up these camps. Sometimes they're abandoned camps. So what we're proposing is we, we started looking at this, the policies attached that we're using. Uh, Current code language is in that policy. However, we can change that. Uh, we also looked at the previous camping code, prohibited camping has not been updated since 2013. Uh, looking at that, there's some specific things and challenges that we came across. One of them is in there, it's a affirmative defense that someone could give someone written permission on private property to basically camp indefinitely. That is a very big problem. It could be, it's sanitary issues and whatnot. So with the new proposed, it follows kind of like Gresham's code, we're up to three day or up to 72 hours um, in a 30 day period, um, unless there's some sort of natural disaster or the city manager approves. Um, also, we realized that we're having some issues with RVs and vehicles, and we have specific uh, incidents on that um, at the Clackamas Park and the overflow. People are not using that campsite to camp and they're going into that overflow and then all of a sudden they're staying there and it's very difficult to get them to move and whatnot. So uh, we also had a, a woman who was evicted. She has mental health issues. Mike, they worked very closely with her. I know the community was trying to support her and everything and she got evicted and we worked very diligently. However, we weren't able to get her into housing because she was pretty resistant on housing. So some of those things that we're coming across, we're asking that you take a look at this language and adopt this current language that is basically more specific, sorry, more specific um, and would help us out. Okay, let's take pub comment first. Can I can go through. Captain Davis, a question? Absolutely. Yes. Or do you want me to wait? Go ahead. Um, Captain Davis, so I understand that there has been some concern uh, with uh, our neighbors to the north. So why is there the assumption that this is our problem as opposed to a countywide problem? Because I understand that there are people who are without housing and who are camping everywhere. I mean, no, no community is immune to this. I, I wish I could say somebody's immune to it, but I don't think any, any community is. Absolutely, no community is. I think the global problem is this Clackamas County has no long-term shelters for anyone. So for us to provide sheltering for these individuals, we have to reach out to our community partners in Multnomah County and wherever we can find. So that could be through VA housing. Um, and so right now there is no long-term solution. So because of Boise, we have to find those. And we have found some shelters where we're able to give people temporary housing, where then our homeless liaison will continue to work with them to get them permanent housing if we can. And uh, Mike has been very successful in that. I, we have countless stories of where he's been able to do that. So. Um, this is just basically we need to, it affects everyone. Right. That's and then every every community interprets that differently. Um, but we've sought legal advice trying to make sure we're doing it properly and legally. All right. So my second question is, is that I, I have been aware and have read parts of the, the Boise case. And I guess part of what my concern is, and I think anybody would be concerned is, and I don't think you'll be able to answer this question, but where do the rights of one person 
conflict and impact the rights of somebody else. So, I mean, you've got two mm -hmm. conflicting things going on here with person A having the right to do X and person B having a right, and there's no middle, there doesn't appear to be any middle ground, and that's probably my biggest question I had about that case, and I know that they defined it fairly narrowly. Yeah, but it's, personally, it's vague, too, because they left vague. a lot of open, open. interpretation, That's and you could problem. go to one attorney, and they can have an interpretation of what we can and can't do, and then you can go to another one. There's, it's not super specific. So. It's not it's over with everything. Right. So, we, <laughs> and so when the Ninth Circuit oversees Oregon, including right, Boise yeah. and Washington and California, yeah. that when they make a ruling, that is now the law. Yeah, I know that's now so, the law of the land. I agree. Right. Really familiar with but the Ninth Circuit. My understanding is Boise is trying to appeal that to the Supreme Court. Yeah. I don't know if they'll actually hear the case. Okay. That's another story. Thank you. We're done with the yep. legalese here. So um, <laughs> let's go on and take uh, public comment. We've got Dale O'Neill and Angela Holt. Is that it, Katie? Yes. Thank you for everything you do. I appreciate it very much. Thank you for listening to us. Angela, um, you want to come up? Just saves time. So I know this is probably not nothing new that none of us is also here, but we moved into Gladstone about two years ago, and we have a nice view of the path, um, the North Cove, the peninsula. We can see pretty much three quarters of the, of the peninsula. Uh, soon after we moved in, we realized that there was quite a travel of people going over there thinking maybe they were enjoying the walk as they should, and then soon realized that the wheelbarrows were full of homeless yeah. stuff. So as we watched it for a while, um, we decided to take a walk over there, and we went over there, and it was considering appalling what we've seen, the, the, the absolute devastation of um, the human waste, the, the waste that just lays all the way from one end to the other that, of that cove is quite concerning, very disappointing. And it's not that I'm empathetic to, to homeless people. We're very familiar with this whole process. So as two years, we have been working. I, I feel, I feel, you're willing to bet my wife's emailed you, uh, maybe talked to you, talked to everybody. Um, and, and really our concern is, is one, first of all, that, that the people that pay for that environment, that pay for that walk, that pay for that path I used to walk on no longer can enjoy that. People are afraid to walk that. Um, and since recently, since that fence has been put up, now people, we literally, I can sit on my deck and watch people coming down, especially with young kids, they just turn around and they're going the other way. They're not even gonna go down there and deal with it. So since they've moved out of the <coughs> peninsula, which last year we had to call the fire department because they literally started a forest fire. Uh, a month ago, they, blatantly just opened, after they moved outside of the fence, they started a blatantly open burning fire. Again, had to call the fire department, they come over, put over the curb. We go over there and we take a look at it and we're like, nice, we've got plastic, we've got aerosol cans, we've got anything you can imagine is just being thrown into this pile. In, in the fire? In the fire, that was part of the fire, oh, absolutely. Okay. It's just billowing black smoke, everybody can see it, and, and with no care. So, um, so again, we, we were there, look, and then last year, as the river came up, and I've got some, these aren't even good pictures of the debris that goes into the cove. I mean, it's just unbearably bad. So now we have this camp, whoever it is, um, has moved outside of the fence. They're 40 feet from the walkway, and they're 40 feet from the river, and that's where they're at. And we get to sit a look outside of our, our house and look at, instead of looking at a really nice, what we paid for, what I like to believe, um, now we're looking at this camp being continually built up and built up and knowing that this debris is going into the river. Some of the last coho runs we have in the world are in the, the Clackamas River. So it's very concerning the, the debris that's been allowed to go in there for, as we've been watching it, over two and a half years. And I understand people are working hard. We really do understand that. Thank Thanks, you. sir. So thank you for letting us come over and, and comment. And I, I appreciate- And um, you are, and look where? I beg your pardon? You are? I apologize. Uh, Angela Holt, and I'm from Gladstone, thank so thank you. And so, in part because I think we, we see what maybe you don't see every day. Um, we have kind of a front row seat to to what's occurring and, um, and appreciate, you know, really, really greatly appreciate the efforts that you're taking, the efforts of your officers to, to really mitigate the problem. So, so thank you. Even though we're on the other side of the river, we certainly appreciate the efforts that you're all making. Um, you know, and I, I hear you in terms of this is this is a complex issue, um, but it is also a public safety issue for for all of the reasons that that my neighbor mentioned. Um, when the waters rose last spring, I can't even tell you the debris that landed in our yard that was completely unsafe, and so for the children and families and people who come down to enjoy the river. Um, we've seen children walking right next to where some of the camps are with some just terrible debris. Um, there are people who are 
you know, have mental, some very severe mental health issues, that doesn't, I don't mean to marginalize them, but it does become a public safety issue when they are acting out or acting violently. Um, I have had people yell threats at me, and you might say, well, you're on the other side of the river. Why would you be afraid? Well, in the summer, they can walk across that river. Um, and in the winter, they can walk around and can see our home. Um, you know, I have had people scream at me. I don't like to go down on the beach sometimes in the summer anymore because I don't feel safe. And if I'm not feeling safe, I can only imagine what people in the cove are feeling or people walking there. So I just wanted to come and support the actions that are being taken and also say thank you for looking at this in a, in a, in a very innovative way. So thank you. Thank you. Freely, I want to say something. So as far as the, 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 the mental illness part of this problem, um, there's really nothing we can do, but there is something the state could do if they chose to stand up and do it. So the way to affect that is to call Mark Meek, he's your state rep, mm -hmm. and tell him that you want the legislator to, to make a fix to, to, to build mental hospitals and to okay. change the law so that we can commit these folks for a short period of time okay. and give them the help that they need. I was on the Albertina Kerr board for eight years. Um, right. Which is, yes, and we were always, we turned away about 50% of the people who needed help. So I, I agree with you. Yeah, thank you. Fire alarms at the Care Center, so. <laughs> All right, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, any further discussion? Commissioner Smith. Um, Oops. I'm, I have questions. Um, so what does... Um, uh, other public space mean Anything that else? includes public schools that includes what anything that's not owned privately um, so the county so campus the, the, the school campuses parks is there is there a way uh, or is there a, um, a process in which there is a permit for well, where, where I'm going with this is there are other um, people that sleep in cars or in vehicles or in other things listed here. And this, the way it's written, it's, you know, if someone's uh, parked in Clackamas Park and falls asleep in their car, just pulling up there in the park, this applies. Um, well, except there's a 72-hour window there. Okay. But... The, what I'm questioning, though, is, you know, um, city properties like the end of the Oregon Trail and Terminal right. Center that does encampments that where people spend the night. We've had this discussion before. If a carnival company comes into the city for a festival, they sleep in their trucks. Um, if you have someone that opens a tree lot on a, a, a maybe a public space or a, a, would churches be public? Not, no, it's public it's owned, not public. private, publicly owned. Um, so, I think there's other pieces here that I'm curious about how we address those, and if there's, you know, a special event kind of permit or something that well, people think, go through to do that, or I think what? What it is is that it says that if they have written permission, and so when we Does have it say that it doesn't say it says that. that somewhere it says in there. It's an affirmative defense that if you have permission of the private party to be there or the to three owner. Months. So my point is, we have a carnival come for right. at Clackamas the Park. They're going to have to authorized permission and do that. I, I would imagine in that process we could. Can you tell no. me where that line is? So where it says it's right. It, oh, you. If you, you switch to the um, this one. the presentation mode, yeah. it the has the proposed. Has given written permission to camp and in no event more than seventy. Well, where is that on the red right. version? Right here. It's right there. Well, number two. Mm -hmm. uh, that's the proposed code change. So the red line version. Well, while we're doing this, Mr. Gibbard, you want to say what you got to say? Whoops, packet, sorry. Wrong way. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. My name is William Gifford. I live in Oregon City. I wanted to make sure the people from Gladstone didn't think that they were the only ones that, that were concerned about this. That there are Oregon City residents that are very concerned about this as well. Um, uh, most specifically, I was just looking at um, uh, walking all along the, the, um, the pathway there by the cove this last Sunday. And it looks as though uh, a fence has been put up. Yes, it has. A bit of a barricade. 
And, uh, and so I was just looking at a picture that I took of two tents on this, on, on between the, the, the path and that fence. I mean, it's, it's just so blatant that, I mean, the fence is obviously giving a message. And then while I was, while I was taking a picture of that, I saw some individual leave one of the tents and just walk around the fence and down the, and down the rest of the peninsula. So I, I'm just suggesting that perhaps that fence isn't doing as much good as it could. Well, we and I also wanted to make a distinction. You can't put the fence in the river, and the, that's the only other way you understood. can do that. Understood. Understood. Um, another point that I wanted to make is a distinction between sleeping and camping. Because to me, I think falling asleep or sleeping on a bench is one thing. But when you, when you have an actual encampment, when you have clothing and food and... Solar panels? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah but, I, but the I, way that this is written, sleep is its own thing. So if just anyone sleeps in a vehicle, a boat, or any of that, it's, 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 there's a comma there. Yeah, so, but... You know, let's saying. not be too nitpicky about well, this because, <laughs> hang on, hang on, let me finish my sentence. That's why we have police officers who exercise discretion. Interpret. So yeah. if somebody falls asleep at, in their car at Clackamas Park, i I rather imagine if it's 9 or 10 o'clock at night and somebody knows about it, they're going to get a tap-tap on their window and say, hey, what are you doing here? So one of the things that any time that we deal with, most of the things that happen inside of our municipal court, it's really interesting because if, if you steal something, you stole something, you get charged. It's, it's a very much more of, it's, it's not as black and white as you think, but it's, there's a lot less gray there. A lot of the things that we do, we have codes that we don't really use that much. It, it's something in our pocket that if we have to, if working with somebody, trying to get them services, uh, conversation, Patients, if that doesn't work, then we've got something that, that we can use. So, so like to the points about, well, what does that fence really do? Um, the, the other problem is with, with uh, one of the challenges of homelessness is when we focus on an area and move people out of an area, they've got to go somewhere. As soon as the cove, someday when that's done, that's going to cause a new, and, and this is not the first time we've had a new, uh, this is the first time we've had somebody from Gladstone come see, but we have had other times where we push people out of an area and all of a sudden one neighborhood's like, what the heck happened? We've got a, a homeless problem. Well, no, it's just the first time you've seen it. Um, the, it is frustrating for us because it, it would be much easier if we could just come up with a couple things that we could, <laughs> that we could very definitively do, but this is just the reality of what communities deal with. It is it, it's just an absolute struggle, and and I don't I don't see any better solution. What I do know that we're doing the right way is um, is we're doing things in a humane fashion. We're treating people fairly. Uh, like to your question about sleep, you're right. If and and we've we've used this analogy quite a bit. If uh, if if my grandfather fell asleep on the on the park bench, you wouldn't kick him off for it. Uh, and, and we're not going to kick a homeless person off for falling asleep on a bench. The real distinction that we make... Should, then why do we say that? Well, We should take that out then. But, but the distinction is if, if you set up a tent in a park and you have nowhere else to go and we can't send you in anywhere else, you, you can park in the tent. That doesn't mean that the next day at 1 o'clock you can also bring solar panels, right. dig a hole for a trash. You know, it's, I think the line we're trying to make is a place to sleep for the night if we can't provide something else versus these encampments where people are creating toilets and, and, and the messes that were being discussed earlier. Just the last, excuse me, One. Mr. Commissioner, if I could just take the last couple of seconds of my time, which okay. was a while back, I just want to say thank you very much for all the effort that the police force and the commission is, is doing to struggle with this very complicated right. problem. Thanks, sir. Robin Winston. Thank you. My name is Robin Winston. I'm the owner of CNR Reforestation. And I want to talk about the uh, perspective of your homeless issues with, from a contractor point of view. And that is that we are the current Oregon Department of Transportation homeless camp and uh, debris removal contractor. It is one of the first contracts they've ever put out for this type of work. And we've been doing it for about a year and a half. Um, Mike Day and 
and Sean asked me to put together some information about how we do this job, the procedures and all the things that we do. And I know that, um, you know, you brought up the issue of, of why, why don't these people do that? Well, we, are, we have our hands tied and we have policies and protocols that we have to follow as a contractor for ODOT. And, and, and the city of Oregon City is part of our contract with ODOT. So the state highways, Highway 213, all the right of way underneath the Oregon City Bridge here and all those things is part of an ODOT contract. Where the jurisdiction lies is, is that the city owns other land that's not belonging to that agency. So we cannot legally or administratively go and pick up those sites. So right now we have a site down on the waterway and we have a camp and it's exactly half on your land and half on ODOT land. So technically we could, you know, clean up the, the site that's on ODOT, but we cannot touch the site on your, on your side of the land. With our contract, we are um, very compassionate with the people that we work with. It is not our intent to move people off of there just because. So we definitely work with them and, and try to get them, you know, in a better place but our job is to pick up the trash. That's really what we want to accomplish at the end. And so, so really when you take a look at this, there's gotta be two parts to this equation. You know, there's the enforcement part of it. You know, there could be violent people or whatever that, or that they have. And then, and then what are you gonna do with all their, their personal property that we call it? And then things that is just trash. And, and that's where we have this information that we can leave here tonight with you and you can take a look at it just to see from an inside look how this contract with ODOT is, is working. And we do have this contract for five years. And I'm also a contractor for the city of Oregon City. We take care of all the detention ponds that you have throughout the city, roughly about 140 sites. So we are seeing, we are in Oregon City a lot. We do see these um, encampments all over. They're, they're encroaching here. And, and we do know that as, as the people are removed or their debris is removed from the sites up in the Portland area and there, they're gonna move south, they already are. McMinnville has a huge problem at this time and it's gonna get worse. And, and I think you're on the right track really with the, to redefine your ordinances, to, to get some you know, legal guidelines for if you do put up a contract, what that's gonna look like and how you're gonna go about you know, working together to make that happen. But I just wanted to let you know that, there, that we are available, that we have been doing this for a year and a half. And hopefully you'll take a look at this information that we have and, and um, make a decision Thanks, to sir. go along with what you're doing. Appreciate your time. Do you, you have that with you now? Yes. Oh, that'd be great. You we should leave, give those to you. Okay, thank you. This recorder. Is there any questions for me before? I was no. just curious what is going on with the detention ponds. The okay. detention ponds? Yeah, I mean, every time I go by one and look at them, they look pretty clean to me. So obviously, you're doing a fantastic obviously job, and we're I don't doing even our job then. and I don't notice anything <laughs> in it. But Commissioner Rosano, I'll just make a comment. And I read this ordinance in its entirety, from page one to the final page. I've been a party to this, met with the people from uh, other cities. This ordinance is objective. It's got a defined process. It is within the laws that is currently defined. It gives this community a way to deal with a difficult situation and quite honestly is compassionate and it lays it out so that there's no interpretations are minimal. I mean, it's a very good law that gives us a good starting point. I think it's well done. You want to make a motion? I don't know if there's not another comment. Commissioner so. Smith. So my, my issue is you know, when I read this definitions um, under B2, where it says written permission, it says that is tied to it being occupied and approved as residential use, which our parks are not. Um, those aren't two separate things. It says it has to be both. Mr. Yeah. Kabeisman, you have something to say about this? Um, I, I, you know, it as Commissioner Smith says it, that. Um, you know, written permission to camp is tied to the residential yeah. use. So Which if there is an encampment... Hosts, our park um, hosts that camp in our parks every night, this is against the code. There's another provision that allows camping in uh, 1216. That separates it? Let me pull that up. You can go. For Clackamas Park, would 
fall under subset B, subsection one at the end of the city for the permitted use and the built for the purpose of campgrounds or overnight parks. So, Clackamas well, Park is other designed parks that. where people are camp hosts than Clackamas Park. I don't know if there's other ordinances that cover those or agreements. Well, that's well hold on, hold on a second. We, when we have a park host, we have yeah. some kind of a written agreement with that host, right? Yes. Right. We should, yes. So, we do. do we? Yes, we do. They're okay. an employee of the city. We All right. hire them and pay for them to And be so there. in that, does that give them the permission to park their RV at, uh, say, Chapin Park? Because I, I know I've seen the, uh, an RV there. We advertise it as uh, staying at the park. Okay. So they're there. It seems like it's, that's covered. How is it covered when when the written permission is tied to residential use? So the residential the use contract between the city and the the city employee that is the park host covers it. It's, I, it doesn't have anything to do with this ordinance. I, I think that's two separate things. Uh, the you know the second one is for residential use, but I think is as uh, uh, Captain Davis said said. Um, you know, other than an area approved by the city for the permitted use and built for the purpose of campgrounds or overnight parks. And so you've got, you know, the, the park host is in an area where the city has approved the use as, uh, as camping and overnight use. Mm. Isn't, that, isn't this covered under Exhibit B? Um, uh, but that's the so Exhibit that's B the is a policy and it's not version, right? the ordinance. Well, I'm looking at Exhibit B, which says clean up on public property, who it affects. I think we're making much ado about nothing here. I, you know, let's put it in place. If we have a problem, we can always come back and address it. As I said, I'm comfortable with it as written. I've read it. There's provision for almost everything you can think of, occupied, unoccupied, private, public. I'll make a motion to adopt this first reading of this ordinance. I'll second. Number 19-1020. Boone, second, Mr. Beisman. Ordinance, uh, sorry. <laughs> Number 19-1020, an ordinance of the City of Oregon City, amending Title 12, streets, sidewalks, and public places, City of Oregon City Municipal Code, Section 12.16.04, camping prohibited. Call roll. Commissioner Denise McGriff. Aye. Commissioner Frank O'Donnell. Aye. Commissioner Rocky Smith. No. Mayor Dan Holliday. Aye. Moving on. 19-136, uh, second reading board is 19-1018, annexation, zone change, seven lot subdivision, minor variance request for 1476 South Maple Lane, Ms. Turway. Thank you, I'm here to answer any questions that you have. With that, we just recommend approval. I have no questions. Hearing no questions, I'll make the motion to approve ordinance number 19-1018. Mr. Gebeisman. Oh, uh, second. Oh, is there a second? Sorry. I just assumed there would be a second, second reading. Second. Mr. Gebeisman. Ordinance number 19-1018, an ordinance of the City of Oregon City approving an annexation amending Title 17 zoning, Chapter 17.06.020, and amending the official zoning map of the Oregon City Municipal Code from FU10 Urban, Future Urban 10 Acres to R-3.5 Residential District, approving a seven lot subdivision and a minor variance to lot depth for one acre of property identified as Clackamas County Map 3-2E-04DB, comma, tax lot 200. Call roll. Commissioner Frank O'Donnell? Aye. Commissioner Rocky Smith? Aye. Mayor Dan Holliday? Aye. Okay. Anybody want to pull anything from the consent agenda? No. Is there a motion? Move to approve the consent agenda. Second. Moved and seconded. Call roll, please. Commissioner Frank O'Donnell? Aye. Commissioner Rocky Smith? Aye. Mayor Dan Holliday? Aye. Motion carries. A couple of quick updates uh, from Mr. Way. Um, okay, but I'm, I've had all I can do tonight. So, Commissioner McDonald, you want to? Certainly. But we yeah. can't do that until. Um, well, we're not making any more decisions, so you can do updates without a quorum. Uh, 
I've signed all the stuff for you, Katie. Okay. Thank you. All right. I have two things um, that are very exciting for you. First is um, our Friends of Trees event, which was held on Saturday, November 23rd. We had more than 200 participants, so an all-time high amount of people who helped us come out and plant trees, um, generally within the planter strips around our community. We planted 85 trees and just an overwhelming success. Um, and yeah, in fact, I got turned away. It was really, really great. I was the only one, nobody else did. Um, so great success, lots of people, new faces, helping Oregon City grow. And then the other update I have is about our comprehensive plan. As you know, we had a, a strategy to receive two grants, um, which had never been done with these two particular grants to fund one project. Um, we applied for and received a grant from ODOT. Uh, which was a little bit more than $125,000. I am pleased to announce that we received the second grant this week, uh, which was a DLCD grant for technical assistance. And so um, we'll be looking forward to working with the community this next year. Very good, thank you. Anything else, anything additional from staff? Just a couple more real quick. Uh, update from Mr. Lewis. So, uh, just letting you know, I should have had a graphic for this. Any other little items on the agenda? Just but one. The, just yeah, just one graph. So the uh, tree. We've got a median tree in the median of the pedestrian crossing at Tachos, and we're going through the tree removal process. Just wanted to let you know it's in the public right of way. It's not on private property, but it's a uh, it's grown. It's grown wide enough to where pedestrian. It's. Uh, an obstruction for a driver mm -hmm. to not see the pedestrian. So our intent is to remove that tree and um, probably not replant it. Um, it's a small median, and I just wanted to ask Tony if I could share so that we could keep on the right plane with our tree removals in, in the public right away. Probably won't bring all of those to you, but I thought that one was one that you might want to know about. Can you put a tree in there that is suitable for the median? that will grow really tall and won't be an obstruction. I hate to see nothing there. It's so small, Denise. It's I know, but they, they do make trees for small, small um, right-of-ways. Um, they do, but usually they're, they're a lower growing, but we'll, we'll look at it. Yeah, uh, the reason I'm saying that is because I don't know if you've noticed the trees that are adjacent to Tachos, they've all been topped. And I, I did uh, alert staff to that. And so having no trees there and having to look at those trees that have been literally had their heads chopped off is not, I mean, it, it messes with the streetscape that, that you so lovingly and professionally helped put in. And I really appreciate the streetscape improvements. They really softened Malola Avenue. Although I will say in certain places, I missed the four lanes because when the school bus stops or TriMet stops, it just backs up everywhere. But it is nicer driving up there than it has been in the years that I've lived here in Oregon City. So if you can put something there, uh, if it's not a tree, I'd like to just see something else there so it's just not completely devoid of any plant material. Okay. Well, my concern is safety first, so I don't care if there's a tree there or not. As long as I can see pedestrians, that's what I care about. Anything else from staff? Real quick, two more real quick. Go ahead. Um, I just wanted to um, remind everybody that on Saturday, December 7th, 4.30 to 6.30, we'll have the Oregon downtown Oregon City tree lighting event at Liberty Plaza at 8th and Main Street. Um, so hopefully you can come down and join us for the events and, um, and Santa making his way downtown. Uh, we'll also have Heritage Holidays going on on Saturday, December 7th. Uh, come celebrate holidays at Historic Homes. Uh, uh, admission is free. Uh, free tours, holiday decor, and share holiday spirit. The McLaughlin House, Barclay House, will be open 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. Holmes House Museum at the Rose Farm, 11 a.m. to 4 p.m. Stevens Crawford House, 10.30 a.m. to 4.30. And Ermatinger House from 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. Uh, with different events at each of those facilities. Can and I then amend that slightly? I'm sorry? Can I amend that slightly when you're done? Yes, certainly. Go ahead. Oh. Um, just want to say, just on behalf of the museums, that donations are generally accepted. So please be generous. And there will be lots of really awesome refreshments. And if you want to come see me, or are you going to be at the Ermitinger? Nope. Okay, well, I'm going to be at the Holmes House in period clothing. So if you want to come see me dressed okay, up like 1847, come on down. 
Thank you. Um, and I will give you an extra cookie. And last, <laughs> <laughs> sorry, threw, threw me off there for a second. Well, that can, they're really good. They're really good cookies. They're McTavish shortbread. <laughs> All right, I'm running with it. Just, tomorrow, December 5th, library director meet and greet at the library from 6 to 8 p.m. Come meet the four finalists um, as uh, library director Cole is retiring in January. So we'll be moving through that process to um, interview her replacement. And then uh, on December 13th, an appropriate day, Friday the 13th, a retirement celebration for Miss Cole, 3 to 6 p.m. at the Oregon City Library. Last but not least, um, a little bit of congratulations here. The finance, the finance department was recently awarded the Certificate of Achievement for Excellence in Financial Reporting for the city's fiscal year ended uh, 2018 comprehensive annual financial report. The Certificate of Achievement is the highest form of recognition in governmental accounting and financial reporting, and it's a Attainment represents a significant accomplishment by a government and its management. Um, I'd like to thank Wyatt and Maria and the rest of the financial team for the hard work uh, that they do year after year um, with our city finances. Uh, that's all that I have for Way tonight. To go, Mr. Thank Parno. you. Yeah. Well, I'd like to invite all our citizens to tour our historical buildings. It's well worthwhile, very enjoyable. I want to congratulate Mr. Parno again and his staff for all the good work they did and continue to do. And I invite those who come pay honors to our library director who has done a great job, who's going to be missed and looks younger every day since she decided to retire. <laughs> <laughs> Anything further from staff? Nothing from staff. Is there more? That's all. Awesome. Anything from my fellow commissioners? I Commissioner have something. Smith? So Mr. Um, I just want to add to, th there's so many things going on on December 7th. So heritage holidays, the tree lighting, prior to the tree lighting, actually there's going to, I've seen, I've had to piece it together because there's so many different things going on, but there's actually events going on at Liberty Plaza starting at 10 or 11 in the morning all day long, bands going on, um, Building Blocks for Kids is doing it a, uh, an event down there um, in conjunction with downtown. Um, hometown holidays, so they have music going from, I think, 11.30 to 2.30. Um, downtown's also doing a holiday bingo uh, for downtown businesses for people to go around, so there's a lot of stuff going on. You can spend all day. Um, and um, I, I want to um, thank um, the Oregon City Police Department and um, our two school resource officers and the other officers that um, showed up today at Oregon City High School to deal with a pretty scary situation. And um, it, it really hit people today at the school hard. Um, and I just appreciate knowing that we have a police department that does the right thing um, and came in and took care of the situation in um, a way that was actually so subtle um, that most of us had no idea what was going on. Um, and there's, that's a, no yeah. Um, well, um, one of our students was arrested today um, carrying a gun um, in class um, with ammunition. And um, it was, it was uh, uh, you know, one of those situations that I think staff um, is ready for at any given moment, um, but when it actually happens, um, it, it really kind of, um, it didn't hit me until really I think the staff meeting, but people were affected by it today, um, definitely. So just thank you for your work and tell everyone at the police department, thank you so much for looking out for us. Wow. Commissioner? Yes, um, Tony probably already mentioned this, but I spent um, Tuesday with the two staff people from the Small Business Revolution TV show, and many of you probably know by now that Oregon City is in the top 10 as a finalist for this prestigious award. They will be making their decision on January 14th as to whether we make the top five, but I spent the morning in a group session, which was attended by not only uh, Dan Holliday, but also um, Tony Conkle. I sat next to him so he could keep an eye on me. And uh, 
it was really enlightening so much to the point that uh, John George, who is the secretary for the tribes, uh, Grand Ron, said that he wanted to reconvene that same group to come and talk with, with the tribal council. The uh, gals and I and uh, the executive director of the Oregon City Downtown Association, Liz Hanneman, and I walked the full length of Main Street and visited probably at least 40, I lost count, uh, businesses. They spent at least 15 to 20 minutes and even longer with some of the business owners talking to them, asking them questions about what they do, what they like, what they don't like, and I think it was very enlightening for them. And I just want to thank our staff for uh, setting that up and making sure that they were well taken care of. I think they were impressed by what they saw and uh, we are, at a really good point in our development of our downtown, we have obviously more room to grow. And I think that if we are fortunate enough to receive this award, that uh, will just put us over the top and put us in a prime position to be ready for when the legacy project uh, gets almost done, completed, we will be in a really good spot to be ready for that tourism that's going to happen. So I appreciate the fact that um, Liz Hanneman nominated our city and whatever she wrote, I got to see what it is because it was fantastic. And uh, it was also an opportunity for me, you know, many of the business owners, I, I know them, but they don't know what I do in my spare time on Wednesday nights. So <laughs> it was uh, nice just to be able to talk to them with, without them feeling self-conscious about that. Some of them did know, and I did get one question about whether I was on a certain website or not. We had a little long discussion about that. But it was good to hear what they had to say. Uh, people were generally positive. There are a few things here and there that um, the Downtown Association, I believe, is going to address. And once I get that list, I will forward that on to the city manager just so he can be aware of kind of what some of the concerns are downtown. But, you know, go Oregon City. Anything further from anyone present? Hearing nothing, I'd like to thank everybody, all our, our staff members, our commissioners, our volunteers, and our other commissions, and our citizen volunteers. Thanks for everything you do. And with that, I'll adjourn tonight's meeting.